Okay, hi everybody. So this video today is going to be another one related to this business of trans athletes, particularly trans women competing in sport. There are three things that I want to go through with you today that I think that you will find quite interesting. Two of them relating to strength sports, one of them relating to endurance disciplines, one of them is in fact already a published scientific paper, one of them are the provisional findings uh, of a, a scientific investigation that's going on presently and the third one is effectively, well it isn't of that kind, but it is a scientific type analysis uh, of a particular strength athlete that I think you will find quite interesting. I also want to talk today, moving on from trans athletes to intersex athletes, just to give you an update on the Casta Semenya DSD regulation situation, because Casta Semenya is pursuing that now through the Swiss court, so I want to give you the state of play with regard to that. So I will move on to that in a minute, but before I do, I just want to set out why I'm making this video but before that, I just want to set my stall out and effectively defend my right to make this video because I know there are some people who consider this as effectively just adding more fuel to the fire. Why would I want to do that? Noel Plum, you don't have any real interest in this subject. You're just jumping on the bandwagon. It's just another stick to beat trans women with. And that is an absolute load of bunk. Over the past few years, I have made a number of videos advocating for the position of, of transgendered individuals in society. And alongside that, I have made videos uh, about sports, sports performance, and particularly this issue. On this particular issue, I made a video back in 2016 when the IOC present guidelines were introduced. I made a video on this subject last year, and I made a 40-minute video on this subject 20 days before Rationality Rules made his first video that kicked this controversy off. So I think it is quite legitimate for me to continue to talk about this with accusations that I'm just doing it to add fuel to the fire. I've shown that I have an interest in this outside of, of the present uh, shitstorm that has effectively erupted in this particular corner of YouTube. Let's try and keep this separate from that, right? This is more about the facts and the analysis and the discussion and the debate and the arguments and where this is centered. This isn't about any of the nastiness and the vitriol that has been taking place. So why do I want to discuss this? Well, one of the key areas involved in trans women competing um, in female sport, what we colloquially call women's sport, is the business of cross-sex hormone therapy. I'm sure, like me, you will have encountered lots of people who adopt the position. It's not an unreasonable position, let me say, that they are happy for trans women to compete in female events as long as they are on cross-sex hormone therapy, HRT for, for trans women for the prerequisite period of time and that is their position and the reason there is a need for this is that the IOC the International Olympic Committee altered its stance in 2015 and acted in 2016 prior to that time they had required a gonadectomy in terms of trans women that means that you had to have had your testes removed prior to competition and that causes your testosterone level to fall through the floor, actually to levels that are lower than most, almost all biological females. And they altered that to a position where that is no longer a requirement. And actually, all you have to do is reduce your level down to below 10 nanomoles, which is actually still in the male range, but reduce it down to 10 nanomoles or below for 12 months prior to competition. Now, it is interesting, that position of, well, I'm happy for trans women to compete as long as they're on cross-sex hormone therapy, because there is something intrinsic in that, something implied in that, and that is that it is performing a function, whereupon if that function was not performed, it would be unfair for those individuals to compete. And we all understand what that is, and that is that in terms of physiological performance in sport, biological males are here, and biological females are here, such as 
so that at the average level and also at, at the, the elite level, there is a performance difference. And that for it to be fair, for it to satisfy what the female category is all about, the actual reason of having that female category in the first place, we need to do this. We need to have moved the athlete's performance down to the position that they would have been in had they not had the sporting advantages of having gone through male pubertal development and the effects of testosterone ever since. So think on that and think on why that is important because it hinges. It means that your position hinges upon the fact that that cross-sex hormone therapy will do what you hope it is going to do, what you expect it to do and to have crossed that bridge but what about if it doesn't it simply is not logical to say well even if it doesn't that that'll still do because if that is the case if you're not interested in it bridging that gap if you don't see that as a necessity why why make that requirement in the first place right why not just say well tough it out you know um just anybody who identifies as a woman then they can compete whether they are on cross-sex hormone therapy or otherwise so it's really really an important subject this and i the reason that i want to discuss these things is because there are quite a lot of people that i have talked to that hold that position that clearly have an expectation that it is going to do the trick and haven't really seemed to have considered what about if it doesn't if you say to them well maybe it won't perform the trick they won't say no it definitely does it's definitive but it's implied in the way that they talk that they think it really does and that really once the science once it all comes out in the wash it'll show that that it, that it bridges that gap the things that i want to read out for you today right they're not definitive they're not the final word in this by any stretch of the imagination but if that is your position um that cross-sex hormone therapy will do the trick it may give you some pause for thought because when set alongside the things that we already know and we've already been discussing it's these things are going in, in the wrong direction actually then things that are making it look less likely rather than more likely okay that has set the scene so you can see why that this is important to talk about the first of these was reported in the times of course the the great celebrated old newspaper the times of london august the 29th 2019 entitled transgender row stoked by new findings let me just say this is slightly an aside but the picture that they used of a trans woman playing cricket um at the start i i found a little bit distasteful this was an example by the way linked at the end to the article that they talked about before this is an example of the reporting on trans people in sport trans women in sport particularly that i don't approve of because this is so misleading this is what they say linked to that picture at the end of this article the times reported last week how the transgender cricketer maxine blithin who is targeting a place in the england women's team has a batting average of 15.1 for chesham second 11 men's team which is open to men and women and 123 for the st lawrence and highland court women's team in kent on the face of it that sounds pretty egregious doesn't it that just shows ridiculous how much of an advantage she has she's got an astronomical average of 123 for this women's team and he had a quite a, a poor average for a batsman or a batswoman i should say um a 15.1 uh, in what is actually quite a, a reasonably low level it's a club level it's not a first class cricket level it's not a it's not a professional level check chesham second 11 men's team but what this ignores is the fact that men's cricket is much 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 further down the developmental path than women's cricket a lot of people who play for women's teams haven't played as a as a child aren't that well developed as cricketers and have been dragged along and learnt their skills and their skills base is well below the male equivalent i don't think you can draw anything from that kind of analysis it is misleading and it gives people a false impression of what is going on that's unrelated to what i'm talking about today but i can't let that go because it's important to challenge things like that as well on with the relevant parts of this article let me read you the first few paragraphs 
Testosterone suppression for transgender women has little effect on reducing muscle strength even after a year of treatment, according to new findings. Researchers say the findings could have important implications for transgender athletes in female sport. Most sports governing bodies, including the IOC, now have policies saying trans women must take testosterone blockers for at least a year before they can compete at the elite level. But findings at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, to be published this year, have shown the effect of the hormone treatment in relation to reducing leg muscle strength is almost negligible for men who transition to become women. That could be significant in sporting terms because it indicates the physical advantages of biological males are maintained even after transitioning and after hormone therapy to reduce testosterone levels. Okay, I'm going to read you the findings from that. I already knew some of the findings from this, in fact, because... This is an ongoing piece of research from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden and they published some of their interim findings 12 months into the study back on Thursday the 11th of April at a poster session at a conference. If you're not aware of what poster sessions they are, they are kind of sessions that they have there and effectively you can pin a bit of work to the wall. Uh, effectively, it could be the provisional findings of an ongoing piece of research that is of some high level, or it can be just some students' work. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, studying acoustic engineering as part of my final project into let's see if i can remember it now uh factors affecting noise annoyance in buildings above underground railways i had my uh, findings my undergraduate research published on a poster session pinned on a wall uh, at, a, at a conference uh dealing with uh, industrial noise uh, so lots of different things can be published on these things that doesn't say anything about the strength of the research but the researchers and the research body tells you that this is a substantial piece of research this is what they had to say on this poster session i have it here 12 transgender individuals six trans men and six trans women who had been accepted to start gender-affirming medical intervention were recruited. Knee extensor and flexor muscle strength were assessed, so that's extending your knee and, and flexing your knee, were assessed using isokinetic dynamometry at three different angular vel velocities, 0, 60 and 90 degrees a second. The assessments were made at four time points before treatment initiation, four weeks after initial gonadal hormonal downregulation, but before hormone, hormone replacement, three months after hormone replacement, and 11 months after hormone replacement therapy. We're really interested in comparing T1 and 4, and that's what they talk about here. Okay, the cross-sectional area and radiological density of the thigh muscles were assessed by CT scans performed bilaterally at the midpoint of femur of each subject at baseline and after 11 months of cross-sex hormone treatment. These were the results and conclusions for these six trans women and six men. Muscle area increased 17% in trans men with an 8% increase in radiological density after 11 months of cross-sex hormone treatment. No change was seen in trans women. There was significant group um, X-time interactions at each angular velocity thus while the trans men increased their strength over the four time points strength levels were generally maintained in the trans women when averaging the three strength tests knee extension 16 percent and knee flexion 34 percent strength increased from t1 to t4 in trans men the corresponding changes in the trans women groups were minus six percent and naught percent respectively so clearly what they're reporting on here is with regard to trans men regard to biological females giving them those that big testosterone boost increased both the size of the muscles and the strength of the muscle but it didn't reducing it seemed to have very very little difference really surprising this as far as i'm concerned very little difference whatsoever with regards to trans women now that was back in april 
in this end of August, Tommy Lundberg, Dr. Tommy Lundberg, who is one of the researchers, spoke with the Times. And at this point, it seems that they have had the data in from more of their subjects. This is what it says going back to the Times. Dr. Tommy Lundberg, an exercise physiolog physiologist at the Karolinska Institute, who has led the research, said that muscle mass dropped by 5% after a year's treatment but that the effect on trans women's muscle strength was negligible. The research was carried out on 23 volunteers, 12 trans women and 11 trans men, so now you've doubled the sample size to 12 trans women, to monitor changes in muscle mass and strength during and after a year of hormone treatment, uh, hormone therapy. Lundberg told the Times, there has been no research at all previously on what happens, especially in terms of strength after transitioning. This is relevant for sports where strength is considered an advantage. We have found that trans women's muscle mass decreases by 5% after a year, but they maintained their strength levels throughout the treatment period so i leave this up on screen you can read a little bit more of what it says on that what are we to make of this i find this rather surprising almost a little bit difficult to believe that there was no reduction in strength whatsoever and my feeling is is that if you got more data um, and a, a more comprehensive set of data with individuals and over a greater set of tests that you will see a reduction in strength. I find it really, 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 really difficult to believe that you will not, which find, makes, makes this data seem really strange to me. But what ought to give us cause for concern? The strength business, it's such a big bridge to cross male typical biological male strength and biological female strength it's such a big divide here um that the fact that even if this data is at the extreme end of what you would expect I, I, it really makes me have some concern that cross-sex hormone therapy is going to bridge that gap i find it hard to believe that with a bigger and better set of data it would bridge that gap and we would still end up with sets of results albeit this is a provisional set of results that are giving us things such as this okay so that is the first one to consider the second one is a little bit different, but absolutely fascinating, I think you will find, and again related to the business of strength within sport. I have Dr. Ross Tucker to thank, by the way, for linking me this. There's a lot of talk about people about leaving this to the experts. I think Ross Tucker is somebody who could reliably re be regarded as an expert in the business of sports science and sports science performance enhancement. He's formed, uh, well, he's been involved in this since before the Castor Semenya situation started back in 2008. He's one of the two co-hosts of the Science of Sport podcast and Dooley was actually called as one of the expert witnesses by the Castor Semenya team in their presentation to the Court of Arbitration for Sport earlier on in this year so that puts that into some kind of perspective he thought this was something that was very very interesting and even though it relates to just one athlete it's still pretty interesting the athlete it relates to is mary gregory the power lifter and if you've been following some of the videos on youtube that may ring a few bells you may recall that Rationality Rules talked about Mary Gregory because she had broken a trans woman, owed, um, transitioned and competed as a f uh, uh, alongside female powerlifters in the women's category and had broken a series of world records. And he found that of significance and mentioned it in his video. He is not wrong to have done that, and it is something that is of note, but that's not really a very scientific way of looking at things that she broke a few world records. Essence of Thought then responded to that, mentioned that fact, quite right to have done so, then pointed out himself that, well, Mary Gregory may have broke these world records, but there are actually biological females 
um, in other powerlifting federations that are lifting more at the same body weight than Mary Gregory is. That again is a legitimate thing to point out. It's something to take note of, but it's not really a very scientific way, again, of looking at this. It doesn't really tell us any more scientifically. What does tell us something scientifically is what I've talked about here before, which is a graded analysis. This is what Joanna Harper had performed, of course, on her study into endurance athletes, and that is to look at where somebody stands in relation to all their fellow competitors. Are they at about the 80% point where they're better than 80% of athletes, and there's about 20% of athletes in their banding that are better than us? And so what we can say is, where was this person competing as a biological male competing as a man? And then when they've transitioned and taken their cross-sex hormone therapy, if their graded performance is still the same, i.e. they were better than 80% of men in their category, and now after cross-sex hormone therapy, they're better than 80% of women, then we can start to give it a bit of a provisional thumbs up and think, yeah, that seems to have pretty much done the trick. That is what we're hoping to achieve in all of this. Well, this individual has performed that kind of graded analysis on Mary Gregory. And although this is just one individual, I think this is much more useful than either of the, the two individuals that I mentioned before had talked about Mary Gregory. Let me read you out what this individual has to say. I'm going to weigh in on this as I'm one of the guys in Canada who helped run this federation. We when we found out about this, the 100% raw executive circled the wagons and spent almost two full days trying to figure out how to handle the situation. A lot of thought was put into the decision and when the dust settled, 100% raw will not include Mary's records in the female division, but in an entirely new division for transgender athletes. We didn't think it was fair to the biological women in our federation for Mary to compete as a peer, but we also didn't want to exclude people like Mary from enjoying the sport of powerlifting. This was the least worse option we had at our disposal at the time. Now some facts, then in brackets, and this is not to belittle Mary in any way. But when we found out about this, I did some number crunching to see if pure math could help demonstrate if this was just a baseless belief that transgender women had an advantage in female sport or if there was any merit to it. A lot of the numbers used in the male calculation come from Mary's Instagram feed as I was not able to figure out what name she used when she was male and thus could not track down any meat results from that time. Bear that in mind, by the way, everybody, but this is not a scientific analysis, but let's look at these figures. As a male, Mary posted the following numbers pre-HRT on her Instagram account. I'm going to read these numbers out to you now that, that this person has posted, but I'm going to read them in a different order. So I'll read male and female or, or, or competing in the men's category and then competing as a trans woman, I should say, alongside one another. So squat, 408 pounds, Reduced after nine months after starting HRT down to 314 pounds. Bench press from 298 pounds, then reducing down to 233 pounds. Deadlift, 507 pounds, reducing down to 424 pounds. That's giving a total lift, which is how powerlifting works. It's your total across the lifts. 1,213 pounds, reduced down to 971 pounds. Sounds a pretty impressive reduction, doesn't it? Body weight, 217 pounds, down to 179.3 pounds. Okay, so here was the analysis that the person performed. Now, that's about a 20% drop in all her lifts after going on HRT, and about a 20% drop in body weight. That's to be expected as the body adapts to the new hormone levels. In powerlifting, we use the Wilkes coefficient to determine the best lifter across all weight classes. It takes your total and modifies it based on a mathematical formula to allow you to compare yourself against everyone else. Men and women use different formulas as their physiology is different. Mary Wilkes score using the male data was 337 after nine months of HRT when Mary competed in the female division her score jumped up to 399. 
That's a 62 point jump, a 20% increase in her abilities compared to her peers in less than a year. So in nine months on HRT, which reduces testosterone, muscle mass, etc., Mary had gains the likes of which are only seen in brand new lifters who are still learning how to power lift. When I compared Mary's results in the data pace in, in open powerlifting, a website dedicated to recording statistics for all powerlifting federations around the world, here's what I got. In the 40 to 44 age group, Mary's male ranking was at the 38th percentile, so better than average but still middle of the pack. Using her numbers as a female, she moved into the 6th percentile. So top 10% in all of women drugs tested powerlifting in that age group. If all things were equal in the HRT process, we should have seen Mary's results put her in the 38th percentile of female lifters. But clearly that did not happen. So to try and read round there and explain that to you if, if, if that is required. One thing that I said previously on my video essence of thought debunked is not powerlifting is not a very good example to take and one of the reasons i gave is that it's horribly complicated but if this person is to be taken um at face value they are somebody who is involved not just in powerlifting as a powerlifter but in running powerlifting somebody who understands powerlifting so they are the kind of person who could maybe make this kind of an analysis and effectively what they have done is to take two different metrics of graded analysis and each of those metrics have come up with similar results. A Wilkes coefficient is effectively based upon data of lifters in the past. So what you do is you have data and you take lifters based on their biological sex, based on their age and based on their body weight, and you see what they are capable of lifting. And you have a population for each of those different things. For 90 kilo males in their 40 to 45 category, you'll have a population. For female lifters who are 70 to 75 kilos and a 20 to 30 year old you'll have a population and by comparing those com populations you can compare like with like you can see what a typical and what an elite athlete would lift and so you can develop coefficient curves to map them across to one another and thereby determine sort of where people stand within their different fields and compare athletes of different ages of different weights and of different biological sexes and that is what has taken place within that Wilkes coefficient comparison. But then what this individual has done is effectively gone direct to source and said, let's actually look at these population tables themselves and look at where these lifts actually lie in terms of the percentile. Now, the way they've quoted the percentiles is kind of upside down. I would talk of that 38th percentile as the 62nd percentile because you're better than 62% of the population. Um, and the 6% percentile, I talk about the 94th percentile because you're better than 94% of the population but that is a really 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 significant advancement there generally my experience in sport is that when you get into these kinds of things that once you get into the top sort of 20 to 15 percent you start to get into that population of athletes who are taking it really seriously even in terms of amateur athletes, these are the people that are taking it really, really seriously. And so to start to advance into that top 20% and make some progression through it, you need to have all the right physiological beginnings to even get there. And you're getting into the real business end of it here. This is an individual that was better than 62% of powerlifters as a, a male powerlifter competing against other male powerlifters, and yet in the female equivalent, she's right up there in that top echelon. She's better than 94%. That in itself, this is just one individual, but that's a pretty impressive thing, even for one data. I wouldn't expect that to happen, even if you had a thousand individuals. I wouldn't really have expected that to happen if in terms of strength, cross-sex hormone therapy was doing the things that we were expecting it to do. Again, 
It's just one thing. This isn't the definitive final word on it. But I think it is pause for thought for people who say, I'm happy for trans women to compete alongside biological females as long as they're taking cross-sex hormone therapy, to say to themselves, if it doesn't make the difference in any particular sport, where do we go from there? I have to say that the path that this powerlifting federation went down, I have some concerns. Creating a new category just for trans women... I find a bit isolating and you're creating a category that's hardly going to be populated at all. Why bother going to a meeting if all you're competing against each time is yourself? And obviously in things like the Athletics World Championships, uh, the, the World Swimming Championships um, or the Olympic Games, we're not going to have four 100 meters finals, one of which is competed where... Over 50%, 50, almost 51% of the world's population is eligible to compete. Another where about 49% of the world's population is eligible to compete. And then two other categories that are only eligible athletes are a fraction of 1% of the population. It's, it's, it's just a ridiculous set of circumstances and that is never going to work. So I'm not particularly enamoured with the solution that they found in terms of this but clearly in terms of this analysis it gives us some pause for thought that we need to think about the kinds of solutions that we would put in place in lieu of just allowing trans women to compete with biological females if those cross-sex hormones are not doing what we hope they would do that is the second one the third one is a little bit different it's still very very interesting and this involves an actual piece of peer-reviewed science that deals now in the field of endurance and haemoglobin levels. So I'm sure when I say to all of you, interpreting laboratory results in transgender patients on hormone therapy by Tiffany Roberts, Colleen Kraft, et al. 2014, published in the American Journal of Medicine, I'm sure most of you will stare blankly at me and think, no, I don't really remember any of that. But when I show you this graph of haemoglobin levels, then if you'd followed any of the discussions on YouTube, uh, particularly involving rationality rules and essence of thought on this subject, then then that might start to ring a few bells for you. Because it was indeed this table that rationality rules showed in his original video, in essence of thought, criticised him for. And what we are looking here is three populations of individuals. Uh, typical males, typical females, and then male to female uh, trans women effectively biological males on cross sex hormone therapy what each of these tables is showing the midline is showing the average the box is showing you the interquartile range so that's effectively from the 25th percentile up to the 75th percentile the middle 50% and then the whiskers are showing you from the 2.5th percentile to the 97.5th percentile so effectively the range um with just the very end taken off just so that real outliers that could make our statistics very very strange because it could be a, a faulty piece of data or just somebody with something that we can't account for just just truncating them off the ends to give us an idea a more reasonable idea of the range what we would be hoping to see is that male graph on the left mutate all the way down to the female graph on the right. And rationality rule made a play that that had not happened, but hyperbolized it, over-exaggerated it, because as you can see, in actual fact, it's not far off, both in terms of the range and... Uh, and the interquartile range and in terms of the overall range. In fact, the interquartile range of, of those transitioning lies within the interquartile range of the biological females who were tested, albeit at the upper end of that spectrum, it still lies within it. And so Essence of Thought was well within his rights to call him out on that and say that he'd over-egged that particular pudding. However... Had 
rationality rules not made reference to that, but instead made reference to the 2019 paper, Impact of Hormone Therapy on Laboratory Values in Transgender Patients, uh, published by Jeffrey Sorrell et al. I won't go through the other names because some of them are quite difficult for me to pronounce. In the journal Clinical Chemistry, he actually would have had the kind of graph that he was talking about rather than the actual graph that he had shown. And interestingly, Jeffrey Sorrell also features on a blog where he talks about some of the subjects that he's interested in, the research he deals in, and he gave us a comparison graph between the results they had got and the results that the earlier uh, Kraft and uh, Robert's paper had got. And this is the comparison of the two. And I have added a column to this, which is number of subjects. Having gone through the two papers and picked out the number of subjects, you can see that the language used in the more recent report is different. They talk about baseline trans women, so effectively that means their biological male population was the trans women that they had available to that they could test before they had begun transitioning, and the baseline trans male, that's the female effectively the baseline biological female population equivalent and that is those trans men that they had access to before they had started the process so they could start their measurement there so that is the equivalent of the male and female categories there they've just labeled them differently but what is interesting is the number of subjects they had available to them this is a substantially larger Sample. You can see that whereas we only had 20 males and females to form our baseline populations, we've got 62 and 87 here. And in terms of those transitioning uh, as, as trans women, we've gone from 55 up to 133. And what is interesting and perhaps depressing for those of us, and I include myself in this, that would like to see this hormone therapy cross-sex hormone therapy do the trick um, and, and bridge this gap that we need to bridge on this larger sample size certainly in terms of this uh, this scientific report here this scientific paper here depressingly the gap looks larger than the gap that was reported in the earlier paper by Roberts and Kraft and is much more in line with that which rationality rules. Now the interquartile range is not lying within the interquartile range of the baseline female population and indeed if you draw a ruler across those whiskers at the end you can see that it's almost exactly the population of trans women is almost exactly in terms of their haemoglobin levels equidistant between the baseline male population and the baseline female population hmm so what do we make of that? I, I find that a little bit depressing because this is one area where I'd hoped this would be the cleanest outcome for all of this. Make no mistake, it's just about the only thing we can do something about. We can't start chipping away at the lengths of your bones, of your biological height, of various different things. But there are some things which clearly cross-sex hormone therapy impacts upon and it looks as if this this business of endurance sport is one area where height isn't particularly important, where a large frame is not advantageous, certainly in terms of running, that it may be one field where the simplest solution and perhaps the, the solution that's palatable to the most people will be available to us. The bridge is crossable and it will have been crossed. But this is going in the wrong direction. This is a study that seemingly seems almost identical to the earlier study. There are a couple of areas that are vague. They both include individuals that have been on uh, cross-sex hormone therapy for the same minimum period, but there's no understanding of what the average period is, etc., etc. But we have a significantly larger population here. And actually, the gap is further from where we want it to be rather than closer from where we want it to be. That's the third of these three things 
that I wanted to show you here. Before I move on to the Castor Semenya part, I just want people to think on this, right? And so if you are one of these people who adopts this position of, well, trans women, it's fine for them to compete in female categories as long as they're on cross-sex hormone therapy. If you haven't thought to yourself, well, what about if it doesn't do the trick that it needs to do to make my statement meaningful, to, to fulfill the things that is implied that it needs to fulfill, otherwise, why am I even making that requirement in the first place? If you haven't started thinking about alternatives and what would be palatable alternatives, what do we do instead? I really would advise you to do that if you're interested in this subject, because from my perspective, I have serious concerns and those concerns are not diminishing. They're going up a little bit that it will turn out in the wash as we get more and more data in and there are, are other studies that are ongoing at the moment that we will find that uh, it isn't going to cross the bridge that we need to cross certainly not in some things where height is very very important probably not in things where strength is important and maybe not in things where endurance characteristics are important okay that ends that part of the video i also want to give you a little bit of an update on the castor semenya situation which effectively dates back this is in the hand of the swiss court at the moment if you're not aware of that and the latest update is about a month out of date it dates back to the 30th of july but this is interesting stuff if you're not aware of what has been going on with this just a little bit of background to bring people up to speed castor semenya is a highly successful south african 800 meters woman uh, who has won gold at, at, at several Olympic Games and she is effectively not able to compete in that category unless she suppresses her testosterone level at the moment as a result of the DSD regulations that have been imposed by the IAAF so that is the um, disorder or differences of sexual development regulations that have been imposed by the international association of athletics federations and as a result of that castor semenya took that case to the court of arbitration for sport as did athletic south africa so both those two parties took the case they were both heard at the same time with the iaaf as the defendant defending their regulations there in front of the court of arbitration for sport the IAAF won their case. Now, just a little bit of extra detail in case you are not aware. The, the DSD regulations only cover a small number of intersex conditions, and all of those are for athletes who are 46XY. That means they are chromosomally male. They are sensitive to androgens. These are not individuals who are completely androgen insensitive. Um, and... Duly, I have now read the full 163-page CAS report, and it took a little bit of reading. But what is interesting is that of those things that are covered by the DSD regulations, the one, the the, the report cannot tell you what Castor Semenya's personal situation is. That's, that's private medical details. But her party keeps talking about 5-alpha reductase deficiency and picking that one out. The ASA picks that one out and the IAAF picks that one out. I think at this point I would be happy to put my neck on the chopping block and say Castor Semenya has 5-alpha reductase deficiency, which is a condition that affects biological males, 46XY chromosomes, who have a set of internal testes that at puberty kick out male levels of testosterone and also produce sperm by the way but their internal geni external genitalia are either female genitalia or sort of ambiguous genitalia so that often at birth they are erroneously assigned female that is often picked up down the line at puberty 
If it isn't picked up down the line at puberty, or if the individual decides they want to keep the gender female, the biological sex female, then their legal sex remains female. This is the category that Castor Semenya was competing in and effectively competing against female competitors, but with a level of testosterone in her body following having gone through something that at least approximates to a male puberty. Uh has a level of testosterone in her body that is a typically male level of testosterone and her body is responsive to that testosterone. That is the situation. The Court of Arbitration for Sport agreed with the IAAF that this is that this is effectively category defeating to allow this kind of thing. To allow an individual like that in a category that is explicitly designed to exclude biological males who have benefited in a sporting sense from having gone through male puberty. Right, that's where we're at. So as a result of losing that case, Casta Semenya did what unfortunately uh, more and more people are doing now, which is then appealing beyond Cass and trying to challenge their decision. I say unfortunately because for international sport to work, we cannot just go by national laws, otherwise we're all going to be competing to different levels. And if we all go by Swiss law, then rather than the world deciding how sport is going to function for the world, we all end up uh, at the beck and call of what the Swiss people decide in terms of their own personal national legislation. But the Court of Arbitration for Sport is centred in Lausanne in Switzerland, and so ultimately you can go down this path if you want to try and book the system and do what sporting bodies were not really supposed to do. They're supposed to accept what the Court of Arbitration for Sport has done. Now, as a result of that, The Swiss court made a super provisional order which overruled the IAAF's victory in the Court of Arbitration for Sport and reinstated Casta Semenya back into women's athletics without suppressing her hormones. That was a super provisional order before the IAAF had a chance to outline their case. Now, as a result of the IAAF then getting a chance to outline their case, We have the situation that took place on the 29th of July 2019, reported a day later, which was that that super provisional measure has been struck down and replaced with a provisional order pending the final decision, which puts those DSD regulations back into effect. But what is interesting is what the Swiss Federal Court had to say with regard to this. So I'm going to read you out. The first half of their press release really just covers the bits that I've already covered, a bit of the background. It's the second half that I want to read out to you and then discuss a couple of the implications. Okay. By order of the 29th of July 2019, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court revokes its super provisional order on the 31st of May 2019 and rejects Casta Semenya's request to adopt provisional measures and grant suspensive effect. The Swiss Federal Supreme Court also rejects, insofar as it is admissible, ASA's, that's Athletic South Africa's, request to provisionally suspend the application of the DSD regulations to all female athletes. The Swiss Federal Supreme Court, first of all, emphasises its strict practice, which applies to the adoption of provisional measures or the granting of suspensive effect in the field of international arbitration. As a rule, important bit this, listen to this, Such orders are only issued if it appears after a summary examination of the case that the appeal seems with high probability to be well founded. It carries on. The Swiss Federal Supreme Court further points out that its power of reviewing cases of international arbitration is very limited and, as a general rule, only involves examining whether... The contested decision is compatible with fundamental principles of public order, order public. That doesn't sound very Swiss, does it? I was trying. It stresses that this also applies in the field of sport and that the Swiss Supreme, the, sorry, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court is by no means a Supreme Court of Sports which could examine the matter freely. 
On this basis, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court concludes in a first summary examination that Castor Semenya's appeal does not appear with high probability to be well founded. The CAS, after thoroughly evaluating the expert evidence, found that the 46XY DSD characteristic has a direct impact on performance in sport which could never be achieved by other women. Thus, with the participation of a female athlete with 46XY DSD in the protected class women, a basic principle of top class sports, namely fair competition, is disregarded from the outset. The Swiss Federal Supreme Court is bound by this finding regarding the impact of 46XY DSD on performance. In the light of the arguments put forward by the CAS after extensive and thorough examination, namely the integrity of female athletics, neither the allegation of an infringement of the principle of non-discrimination nor the alleged violation of order public terrible and um, due to an infringement of their personality and human dignity appears with high probability to be well founded for the same reasons asa's request must also be dismissed to pass this what the swiss federal supreme court is saying they've had a good look at it and it doesn't look like a very strong case but what is interesting is the grounds in which you can make these kind of appeals and the grounds that you can't. If you wish to appeal, as I understand it, against the Court of Arbitration for Sport to the, uh, to the Swiss Federal Supreme Court, you can do it on effectively two grounds. One is that the Court of Arbitration for Sport haven't followed their procedures. They've messed it up. They've gone beyond their bounds. They've not done what they're supposed to do. They've not functioned properly in terms of the legislation which governs how the Court of Arbitration for Sport is supposed to function. That is one way. Or there is this way, which is the order public route. Now, what is interesting with regard to this is that this is the route that Castor Semenya has gone down, and the Swiss Federal Supreme Court really isn't very, very convinced by it. What is particularly interesting with regard to this is that this order public category includes human rights violations. You may be aware that somebody that has kept talking about this again and again and again, their central theme is that what has taken place with regard to this and also as it would pass across to trans athletes with the same kind of regulations are applied is that this is a viola violation it is stripping their their human rights the court of arbitration for sport did not buy that they bought that what was taking place was discrimination it has to be in sport to have men's and women's categories in the first place but that it was a legitimate means to achieve a proportionate aim which makes it a legal and reasonable form of discrimination and now it appears that the Swiss Federal Supreme Court is looking at that and even looking at it in terms of human rights legislation they do not regard it as a human rights violation I just thought you might be interested to know therefore what the present state of play is with regard to Castor Semenya and how that passes across onto some of the arguments that we've been having online and particularly on YouTube. <laughs> okay, that was long enough. I'm sorry that took so long to go through all of that, but I hope that it's given you something to consider. And I honestly, there's not a, nothing that I've said there that I really feel happy chopping out. Um... Do consider it. If this is something you haven't considered before and your position is with regard to cross-sex hormone therapy, it's time to start considering in those sports, in those events, in those disciplines where that doesn't cross the bridge that needs to be crossed. What is your plan B? What is your fallback? How do we, how do we uh, organise sport in terms of that eventuality? Okay. I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching this video. If you've enjoyed this video, subscribe. Uh, if you really enjoy my stuff and you enjoy a lot of my work, I'll leave you a link to my Patreon. You can, you can help fund this channel through that. Also via PayPal recurring payments or via Subscribestar. That's it. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.